I'm going to talk about geo, uh, geo design with City Simulator. City Simulator is a tool that uh, we've built at Atkins. I'm the lead developer. Um, and to get started, uh, we thought about this tool you know, maybe four or five years ago. And um, our thinking, you know, we kind of tried to start with the, the end in mind. Uh, what, what graph do we want this tool to produce for us? Um, so we said, all right, it needs to be uh, a, you know, a time uh, timeline on the bottom axis. Uh, what we want to do with the tool is model resilience. So we need to know how resilient a city is going to be or you know, a municipality uh, or a city or a county, how resilient are they going to be over time? Um, and then probably you know, one of our sort of first light bulb moments was we don't measure resilience uh, with the tool. Uh, we measure prosperity or productivity of a city. Um, resilience is really the ability of a city to bounce back and become productive again after a disaster. So let's uh, put prosperity, productivity, those kind of metrics on our y-axis here. We said, all right, what is going to be the difference between a resilient city and an unresilient city? I don't, I'm not quite sure if unresilient is a word, um, but um, that's, that's what ended up there. Um, initially, you know, if you think about it, during business as usual times, a, a resilient city has a culture of preparedness. So it's probably going to become more productive and improve uh, more rapidly than the unresilient one. When a disaster actually occurs, the, uh, both, both cities are going to take a hit. Um, no city won't. Um, but the resilient city takes a smaller hit uh, compared to the unresilient one. And then uh, in terms of recovery, um, the, unre the resilient city recovers very quickly, whereas the unresilient one, I mean, you can see there's a 20-year time frame there. That's not unrealistic. I mean, if you think of examples like Puerto Rico, um, they were in an economic downturn before two major hurricanes hit them in 2017. It is probably going to be about 20 years before they return back to their level of productivity they were before those events occurred. So we want a tool that will develop this chart for us. How do we get that? Um, it's a tool, so uh, you know, we're developing it. We have to write requirements. Um, here are the five that we came up with, high-level requirements. Capture interacting systems. Um, you know, at, uh, as engineers at Atkins, uh, we focus a lot on flood modeling or uh, environmental modeling, and we kind of keep it in silos. Um, what we understood with this model is that we needed to understand how everything interacted. So if a flood or a disaster occurred in the future, how would it actually impact people and the economy, um, natural systems? Uh, second, we looked at business as usual as well as disasters. Um, quite often, disaster modeling just focuses on a disaster event. We want to know over the 30-year time frame, how does the city do at, at all times? We want to include disasters that are rep representative of climate change. Um, the city's changing over the next 30 years. It's developing and growing, but so is the climate. The climate's changing as well. We needed to model all of it together to understand uh, what the impacts are. Allow for addition of proposed strategies. So it doesn't make sense to just make a tool where you can analyze the city as it is right now. You need to be able to try different things. Um, add a seawall, elevate buildings, um, you know, those sorts of strategies and actions that will result in increased resiliency. We need to be able to quantify whether they do or not. And finally, include a long enough timeline to me measure return on investment. So, you know, a new bridge is millions of dollars and might last for 50 years. Um, we need to measure what is the return on investment over that entire 50 years. One that's sort of implicit and not here is it needs to work in a planning context. So in other words, um, the six to 12 month planning uh, time frame that master plans are developed in, it needs to be able to be uh, pulled off in that amount of time and at the budget that those exercises usually uh, have. So I'm going to talk first about the information model we developed for the tool and then about the simulation process that it does. The information model is um, focused first on people. Uh, we said we wanted to uh, um, you know, establish economics and people impacts, so, so we said, well, let's model the people. So we borrowed a term from transportation engineering called agent-based modeling, and we introduced millions of avatars into our models. So if a city has a million people, we have a million people living in the city and being simulated, going to work, uh, going home, uh, conducting commerce, all of that um, activity on a daily basis. Um, we also have to include infrastructure. You know, these people are using the infrastructure, the resources of the city. 
And because we wanted to establish um, what the impacts, is, impacts are to the people, we needed to model all of the infrastructure together. So parcels, building stock, roads, stormwater, power systems, water supply systems, and so on. Anything that people use, we need to have in our model. Um, then we had to look at system control, um, carrot and stick. So uh, in terms of stick, zoning controls, uh, permitting, um, you know, all those processes. And then in terms of carrot, in incentivizing uh, flood protection, for example, you know, those kind of uh, policies that uh, make the city more resilient through incentivization. What does it all end up looking like? Um, this is Fayetteville, North Carolina. We did a project uh, there. Uh, we actually did the entire state of North Carolina looking at, um, in the wake of Hurricane Matthew, um, you know, what projects could be introduced to increase resiliency. There's 325,000 people in this county and uh, 113,000 buildings. And we have them all modeled. Um, you know, the parcels are there, the buildings are there, you see the roads are there. They're colored according to their congestion rates, which is uh, an outcome of the model. If we pick on one of the buildings, um, we can get information about that building. So this particular building, this, uh, what we've done is we've sampled uh, FEMA flood models and other models related to flood and develop curves for every single building. So if you look at the x-axis there, that's the size of a storm that happens, and the y-axis is the flooding depth that would occur in that building if that storm happened. If you look at the chart on the right, that's a depth damage curve, so that gives you uh, flooding depth to percent of the value of the property uh, in damage. So if we like work an example here, let's say I do a 7.4 uh, inch storm, I get two feet of flooding in that building, two feet of flooding, if you uh, follow the chart, it works out to about 5% of the cost of the house. So that house is a $600,000 house, 5% of $600,000, that's the damage, the storm damage that would occur at that house. We have these for every single building in the, in the county, so when we simulate a storm happening, we can actually add up all the damage that occurs. Similarly, for commercial buildings, um, I picked a commercial building basically in the center of the map there. If I look at uh, information about that building, uh, that, that's a list of agents that you're seeing, the table there. So that's at all the people who work in that building. Um, we also know uh, where all those people live in the city, and so we can do things like commute footprints, and that's what we're looking at on the map here. This is every piece of road that's used by the people who work in that building every day to go to work. So if a storm happens and takes out part of that road network, we get an impact to productivity. Sort of flipping the coin, um, the yellow dots you're seeing there, those are culverts and bridges. Um, we can evaluate everyone who crosses that, the, rid, the road over the, col uh, over the culvert or the bridge, and work out um, which section of the, uh, the city is impacted if that bridge goes down. Um, uh, here I've zoomed into that particular culvert. We get a curve here called an overtopping curve, again, pulled from existing flood models, and it shows us that uh, if rain depth uh, on the x-axis occurs, uh, the level of overtopping that'll occur on the road. If a road gets overtopped by a foot of water, it's likely to blow out the entire roadway as there's that much power with it. So we can then say, all right, if that occurred, that event occurred, everybody crossing that roadway would be uh, uh, either have to take another route or won't get, get to work at all that day uh, for you know, three months, six months, however long it takes to repair. Now I'll go a little bit into the simulator uh, process. Um, that was a data model, now we'll talk about simulation. It works on something called a nested loop algorithm. Um, the outer loop there is run yearly, and that's the urbanization loop, and the inner loop is run daily, and that's the uh, disaster loop. So uh, the outer loop, I'll just go around the circle uh, pretty quickly here. We start with natural system changes. So if we're in a coastal community, for example, and the sea level is rising, we raise the sea level each year, three millimeters, five millimeters, whatever the projection is. We then say, what is the economic projection for the city for the year, and then convert that into new commercial buildings. So we're placing commercial buildings across the city. Uh, we fill those up with avatars, with workers, um, and those people need new housing, so we also place housing across the city. Um, the uh, avatars are gonna have families, so we'll increase the population to accommodate for their families. 
And then in the end, you know, all these new buildings need to be connected up and served, so we add new utilities, new infrastructure. We measure things like um, uh, how all this adjusts the floodplains in the city, um, how much of an impact do ecosystem services there are. Imagine you're you know, taking up some wetland to build a new subdivision. We want to know what the impact is. And what is the change in carbon footprint? So that's run once a year. Uh, the inner loop is the disaster loop. So this is run daily. And the first question that's asked is, did a storm occur? Did a, did a disaster occur um, on that day? We have a forecast that's based on uh, global, global climate models of rainfall. So we can, you know, every day we ask the question, is there a big storm today? We then go to the next circle, which says which structures are affected. So using that data from the flood models, we can get every single building that's impacted. And based on the severity, we can say that building is going to be impacted and not usable for you know, anything from a day to, to months. Um, we also simulate travel within this loop and commerce, uh, people going to school, people going to work, and so on. What does it all look like in the end? Uh, this is what it looks like. It's an, it's an ArcMap extension city simulator. And what it's doing right now is simulating a storm hitting Fayetteville uh, in, this was 2018, I think, um, back when we did this model. And what you can see is there are black dots on the map. Those are the buildings that are flooded during this storm. The green line that you're seeing on the chart, that's the number of people that are not able to get to work or, or able to get to work. So you see it drops when the disaster occurs. And then finally, the, the red line that, that's following, that's the uh, climate change influenced rainfall forecast. So a city, city simulator run just runs like this for 30 years um, each time. And uh, we, ca we capture metrics as this is running, like um, storm damage, like productivity loss, all, the, all that type of information um, as, as the uh, assessment goes. In the end, um, this is what communities are after. Um, the city simulator produces results like this. Um, they're scenario-based, so remember I mentioned that we need to be able to model proposed actions to the community. Um, the scenario one here is an example of one. In Fayetteville, their big problem was a lot of storm damage in the 500-year floodplain and a lot of breached dams. In that one county, there were 30 dams that were breached because of Hurricane Matthew. So they said, all right, let's just throw all the money in the world at the problem. Um, so scenario one is, let's just buy out all the properties in the 500-year floodplain and let's reconstruct the, the breach dams. That would cost them $340 million to do, a number that they would never really be able to get. Um, but it would result in uh, $8.8 million per year of reduced storm damage uh, over a 30-year time frame and $9.3 million increase in city productivity over that same 30-year time frame. So we're talking you know, $20 million a year in uh, savings by spending $340 million. Um, they said, okay, we, we can't ever actually pay for this, so let's uh, look, at, look at some other options. So we said, all right, what if instead of buying all the property in the 500-year floodplain, we just buy the properties that flooded during Matthew? Um, and so that dropped that number down to 55 million. Um, and in terms of dams, let's reconstruct, let's spend more on it and, and reconstruct them uh, with concrete. And so they won't breach again in the future. The net result is that the scenario two gets 70% of the result of scenario one, but it's 16% of the cost. Um, that's valuable and decisionable information that they can, uh, at Fayetteville and um, uh, the department that sponsored this study, North Carolina Emergency Management Department, can go to FEMA and say, you know, this is what we think will happen if we uh, take these steps and it um, moves the needle in terms of getting new funding. City simulators being applied uh, all over the country now and even uh, internationally. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of cases here. Uh, Boulder County, we did a study for them last year, Boulder County Department of Transportation. Um, they were interested in their top 10 disruptors, which bridges and culverts are gonna cause the most trouble in the next 30 years. So we did the analysis and the map on the uh, left shows it. Um, the dots are colored according to number of trips disrupted. And uh, the chart on the right shows uh, the number of trips disrupted during the storms that we simulated. The green bars are disrupted because of the road system. The uh, 
Red bars are disrupted because a person's workplace is flooded, and the blue is because their home is flooded. So the major conclusion we can get from this is that the, um, in terms of productivity disruption, the road system is really the culprit in Boulder over the next 30 years. They took this information to FEMA, and based on this evidence, uh, they received funding from FEMA to redesign three of their top disrupting bridges, and they're now in the process of doing that, and they'll be reconstructing them over the next couple of years. Uh, another uh, case study I wanted to highlight is uh, Florida, South Florida. They're dealing with um, um, sea level rise at the moment, um, significant sea level rise causing what they call sunny day flooding. So here's an example. This is um, Hollywood, Florida. And as you can see on the coastal side there, I mean, we're still getting storms and we're still getting you know, flooding from the storms, but we're also getting the blue roads there. Those are sunny day flooding. So that's a quantification of how many days per quarter um, each of those roads is suffering. If you think about someone living on those roads or, or having a place of business on those roads, um, maybe their house is fine, maybe it's not flooding, but if you're the dry cleaner on one of those roads and someone needs to park in front of your building and that uh, parking space is covered by seawater for four hours of the day, that's a problem. Um, we're working to evaluate um, impacts to commerce like that because of this type of flooding as well. In terms of future directions, um, City Simulator is really a framework for doing lots of different types of modeling. Um, and we've explored a lot of different questions which I haven't covered today. Things like how improving telecommunication systems can uh, increase teleworking and therefore reduce the need to harden infrastructure because people just aren't traveling on that infrastructure. Um, things like cyber threats, um, things like wildfire, heat wave, uh, drought, we're looking at all those things right now. Um, uh, what we want to do even more, though, is go into deeper neighborhood modeling. So, in other words, um, go down to the city block, you know, get kind of Jane Jacobs with it, and um, measure metrics that are walkability, uh, me metrics that are livability, things like that. Um, we think we can, you know, model down at that level and produce really interesting answers. Smart city technology, um, right from the beginning when we conceptualized City Simulator, we thought about smart city technology. What have you replaced all the cars in the middle of your city with uh, autonomous vehicles. You know, what would the impact be? Um, one, you don't need parking spaces anymore um, because they can park elsewhere. Um, you know, there's big impacts that can happen and we'd like to explore that. Interactive scenario development. So at the moment, our model is basically we talk to a community, they tell us what um, they want to do, we go back to our labs and create the scenario, run it and then bring back the results. What if you could do all that online and run it all online in you know, near real time? That would be great. Um, and we need to kind of go uh, highly parallel processing to do it, but we're looking into that. Um, and then finally, uncertainty estimation in cloud. That's, that's related as well. Um, you know, we're, we're forecasting 30 years in the future. It's hard to say you know, on January 27th, 2049, there's going to be a hurricane, or I guess it wouldn't be January. But, um, you know, it's hard to actually say that with any degree of certainty. So we have to look at measuring the uncertainty of our forecasts. To do it right now, what we do is we run a thousand different versions of the future uh, using uh, the same simulation and then look at the distribution of answers that we get for all the metrics. That takes a long time. Uh, we recently purchased a computer with uh, 64 cores so we could speed it up quite a bit. Um, but we want to go cloud with it. We want to be able to fully parallelize it so that, you know, it's a, it's a two-minute operation instead of 13 hours, which is what it takes now. Okay, but thank you.